Dr. Shinju Chen has been researching, developing, and commercializing laser-based gas detectors for over two decades with a current focus on the natural gas infrastructure. He's developed gas sensing systems for ground to rocket based applications. He joined physical sciences in 2017 and is leading the industrial and environmental sensor business area. Dr. Chen received his PhD in aerospace engineering from uh, University of Michigan. So with that, I welcome Chin Ju. No, thank you, Paul. All right, good morning. How's everybody doing? Sorry about the picture. I don't think it represents me at all. Maybe photoshopped. <laughs> but anyway, um, I had a good time yesterday at the hockey game, and I'm sure all of you have had a good time, and especially when the home team won, so that's really good. Um, the reason I brought that, this up is because I, you know, a quick fact about myself is you know, I'm also a figure skater. I started as an adult, so it was challenging to learn how to skate, to stand, stand up on the ice, and be able to do jumps and spins. So, Learning as an adult is really a big challenge. And the reason I mention that is because that sort of reflects how I run my R&D uh, development team at PSI is we like challenges. And challenges is it make, makes us really excited to develop products like the you know, RMLD CS that was an, out, of the, uh, out of PSI, uh, the, uh, the Discover AMLD. And today I'm gonna talk about the uh, RMLD uh, QGI or OGI. The name keep changing, but I'll tell you why it's changing. And I thank Roy for talking about the regulations. And um, I tried to read the regulation, and I'm sorry, but I keep falling asleep. But uh, I, I, I like to know people like Roy who keep me awake to know about the regulation to develop some sensors that are useful for, you know, for, for, for meet certain re regulatory requirements. Um, and I, I apologize for my voice. I might lose a little bit of it. Um, too much screaming last night, too much excitement on, on the hockey game. So please bear with me. So um, I, I will talk uh, about uh, a little bit about what PSI is. I think some of you do not know who, who we are and what we do. And then I'll, I'll talk about you know, the RML, the uh, QGI, what, what it can do, where, where is its status right now, and then talk a little bit about what the upcoming products are uh, from, uh, from my group. So uh, we are a 50-year company. We're employee-owned. Uh, we're headquartered in Andover, Massachusetts. Um, we do a lot of R&D. Um, our major business is actually in the national security, so meaning that we do a lot of projects for the Department of Defense. Uh, we do projects for NASA, uh, for the National Institute of Health, um, but we don't just do R&D. We, we take the, the, the product of the R&D and we find partners. Uh, we develop products, either be all military-based products or in my case here, yeah, I'm more focused on the industrial side of uh, products, so I take the technology that we develop, find a commercial partner like Heath, and then you know, they bring it into from, you know, we, we can do all the way to low production, <clears throat> but when we need something like a, you know, you know, somebody who, who can do a high manufacturing and also selling them to the customers, you know, we definitely need a commercial partner. But not to say that we also um, have manufacturing facility in-house, uh, we have been growing like crazy, like Heath, and I've been meeting a lot of new people that I have never met before uh, from Heath, and this is nice to see that because they are growing, and we are growing too. Uh, right now, we are like 240 uh, people, um, a lot of scientists, engineers, technicians, and administrative staff as well. Uh, and so we, we do have production facility, and these are primarily making uh, things for, for military applications. Uh, some of them is actually the batteries, um, not for the cars, uh, this is that, that's too much out there. We, this is actually a very, very high density um, uh, um, power batteries that are used for uh, unmanned vehicles. It could be underwater or it could be an uh, aerial platform, like a drone, for example. And so we, we have a facility uh, not at the Andover, but at a near, nearby town in Wilmington that produced uh, these batteries. And the demand for that has just skyrocketed the last uh, uh, six months. Uh, we also uh, manufacture high-temperature composite material. These are materials for uh, um, uh, high-speed uh, uh, fly system, like a hypersonic vehicles type or rear-entry rear uh, vehicles. So these are high, high, high uh, material that can survive this uh, high-temperature environment when they, when they re-enter the Earth atmosphere. And then um, another thing is we also uh, develop uh, radiation monitors. Uh, <clears throat> we actually have these um, installed during like a, a, a 
a NASCAR racing area where there's a lot of people, and we want to make sure somebody doesn't bring a dirty bomb. A dirty bomb means just something of like radiation type of bombs that they might bring uh, to the to cause harm to people. So we actually have uh, uh, radiation monitors around these type of areas in a big event, um, and the, and we have uh, sensors that can detect very very low level of uh, of radiation from. Uh, from actually even from people just coming out of, uh, of the hospital, because they go to an area where there's radiation, and we can actually follow the ambulance and see, oh, there's some radiation that is coming from, uh, from an ambulance. Um, so um, we have, you know, we, we, we actually develop a lot of a mobile system that uh, the, the, the U.S. Um, uh, what called, um, border security drives around in this big giant van that has this instrumentation in the back just looking for any sort of radiation sources that is not supposed to be there. And um, with this technology, uh, when we, uh, we think that uh, we can either manufacture it in-house or we can license the technology, this is what we do. We find a partner, we license, license the technology, or we uh, occasionally uh, spin out a, a company to produce the, the, the specific uh, uh, technology that we develop. Um, anyway, this is to give you an overview of the R&D capabilities. And this focus a little bit on the top there, the top row there. So I mentioned energetics. Um, this is uh, about uh, building, uh, let's just say, like rocket motors some, um, that are very stable because you know, when, you, when the rocket motors are in some sort of a missile, for example, right, and they need to stay there very stable for a long period of time, make sure it doesn't degrade. And so we did a lot of research on that. And we have batteries, I mentioned about that already. And we're also developing propulsion systems. Um, these are for hypersonic flights. Uh, they're called rotational detonation engines. Um, they don't burn the, the same way that these are jet engines that you, you flew to here. That's, that's not how they operate. Uh, they use detonation wave to operate uh, these new type of engines. And we have the optical uh, area. Uh, this is a big growing field. The last five years, I think, it has probably quadrupled in terms of the size of the staff that's working on optical. Because the next big thing is, uh, if you think about um, electric, electronic circuits, right? You, you design on the computer and you send to some lab and then they print your circuit out and and looks nice and beautiful and works. This is like taking that same concept, but instead of, oh, here's my laser device, here's my lens, here's my detector, we print everything on a, we call it a photonic integrated circuit. And that's, that's the way of the future. And we're heavily working on that area. Um, <clears throat> data and sensor op exploitations. Obviously, we generate a lot of data, just like he, when they go around and do surveys. Uh, and the, we have a team in-house that do AI and machine learning. I know it's the buzzword, but it does get a lot of contract signed, so <laughs> just to let you know. <laughs> anyway, biomedical, uh, we, we actually also develop a, a, a laser-based system to look at the inside of the retina, making sure that the uh, the eye has a good flow. There's no issues, uh, um, mechanical or, or otherwise, or tissue damages inside the eye. Uh, we also do, um, like for example, when you, do, when you go and do endoscopies, they remove uh, what it calls certain tissues to making sure it's not cancerous. But here we don't do that. You know, we actually analyze the tissue in situ, making sure that this is not a cancer cell and we don't need to remove it. So we're actively working in those areas as well. Um, so. On the bottom right here, this is sort of some of the, uh, the early technology that we've been developing. This is actually a cool one. This is called water capture. It's sort of a backpack that the military can go somewhere in the middle of nowhere. They, they open this thing up. It's a sponge. It sucks up the air in the environment and produce water that the, the soldier can drink. And that's actively uh, it's a DAPA friendly project. And it's moving along very well. The next one is the UUV antenna. Um, it's for underwater uh, unmanned vehicle. Uh, that's, that's the antenna right there. And this is the CAM bio uh, detector that I talked about. Um, uh, this is mounted in, uh, behind a minivan. You can pull the whole rack out. Uh, so it's pretty cool. The last one I was mentioned, this is the rare earth element from coal ash. Coal ash used to be just junk material, right? Uh, people are using coal ash for reinforcing the strength of the concrete. Um, and there's a big DOE program right now to extract rare earth element from a coal ash because we buy a lot of rare earth material from, uh, from overseas. We don't want to depend on the overseas countries, so we want to uh, um, be able to get these uh, elements from, from what we already have, like our, our trash. Uh, the coal ash is actually the, the trash material after you use it for, uh, for power uh, 
for, work, for generating power. And so we, we went from like, this is about, it, it started a decade ago from laboratory, now we've built a huge pilot plant and we're processing coal ashes at the moment to extract these materials. Okay, so I just wanna give an overview of what, uh, what my group does. Um, so we specialize a lot on prototyping, uh, developing instrumentation, and uh, all, they're all laser-based. And also, we also do some other sensors. We're actually working on a, a, on a drone uh, so, um, with some instrumentation net for, uh, for survey. surveying uh, uh, shipyards. When they do construction, they want to make sure that uh, the paint is applied properly or a certain segment of the, of the ship structure are, 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 are properly uh, welded. And so we are developing a drone system for that as well. Just to show you, uh, my team is not very big. We only have about five people right now, but you know, we do tap quite a lot into the other uh, business areas. Uh, we have over 20 business areas, so w whenever we need a certain expertise, we tap the other uh, personnel and help us uh, solve uh, the certain problems for my project. And I won't read everything over there, but uh, one main thing is that you know, we, we emphasize a lot on developing sensors that are not intrusive, meaning we use lasers, right? We do a standoff detections, and uh, we want to make sure that sensor is standalone, compact, low power uh, electronics, and they are battery powered. And so we do emphasize a lot on that. And, and we use measurement technique that provides that, you know, high sens sensitivity. Like the discover AMD, you got you know, tens of PBB level of sensitivity for both the methane and the ethane. And so we, we, you know, we really like to develop that type of instrumentation. Well, what we do well is we, we like to work with our customers to go from the concept all the way to low production and then to production. And one customer that you know, as I'm saying here is uh, he you know, has been with us uh, for uh, what? Like more 25 years now. Uh, this is 2005, sorry. Uh, I wish it was earlier, but anyway, uh, it's 2005. You guys know the RML DIS. Um, some of you have used this. It's a two-component system, right? It's, you got the transceiver and something that's portable. Uh, it, it did its job, but you know it's it's a bit heavy and uh, clunky. But so 2019, the RML DCS came about. Uh, there's some history on that. Is that if you remember, the electronics was like you know eight, eight and a half by eleven or so wide. Um, this thing was you know pretty big. Um, there was an ARPA-E project that uh, helped us to, the ARPA-E monitor project that helped us to take the electronics, the transceiver, and reduce the size of what it is right now. So if you ever see the inside of the electronics for the RML CS, it's like a pancake of, of four or five boards, usually three, three or four boards. And they're like three inches in diameter and one and a half inch thick. And so that was a result of that project from the, uh, the funded by the Department of Energy. And so now I asked to miniaturize the transceiver electronics and now we have the RML DCS. And so that, you know, this instrumentation revolutionized the uh, lake survey industry you know, for the last couple of decades already. And we like that, we like to build stuff that is really good and help the, the environment as well. Um, so then the 2022, uh, he released the uh, Discover AMLD. Yeah, I don't need to talk too much about that. And uh, no, we talked a lot about that. There's some good information uh, that was presented by Kevin and Vinit yesterday. Uh, so I keep that uh, really brief. I know this is a very busy schedule. Uh, uh, sorry, chart. I can probably spend an hour on each one of these, but I won't do that. <laughs> you guys are going to fall asleep. Um, let's give you an overall history and the, the breadth of platform that, that we have developed over the last 25 years uh, at PSI. Uh, start right here, this is the 1994, the Spectra scan. This, uh, this is actually the early uh, sensor that was commercialized. It's an open pass system. It's a fence line monitoring for hydrogen sulfide and, and, uh, and, and hydrogen fluoride. Then it moved on to ammonia and then to CO2, uh, about a decade ago, CO2 was really hot, right? We, just, we want to sequester the CO2 and then it dies, but now it's back again. So this is, this is good, right? It is always like a cycle of uh, every 10 years. I see the same thing for us. I don't know if you got no scramjets, it's the same thing every 10 years. It's like it goes up and down. You got to catch the right wave. But anyway, uh, it's important to note because that, that technology actually led to you know, some of the, the RAM system that, uh, that we have. Uh, uh, install and try it out 
uh, in 2015. There was an early prototype, uh, production prototype. It worked really well. Um, and so, just to mention in, in, in passing here, this is actually a Lyoflux 200. Uh, the reason I want to mention this is because so it shows you how a technology that was developed for the Air Force, looking at mass flow rate going to the engine inlet, became a, a sensor that is measuring the water vapor uh, exiting the, uh, what we call like, for example, when you, when you make uh, uh, in the pharmaceuticals, they have to dry out the, uh, uh, the medication. And so the, the process to, to freeze dry is very, very uh, delicate. And they need to know how much water um, mass is being pulled out of the sample. And so this, this, the, the technology that was adopted for the aircraft engine inlet was adopted to monitor the, uh, the, 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 the drying process. So that was pretty cool. So, so I mentioned about the, um, the, the RPR e-monitor technology uh, project that helped reduce uh, and miniaturize the electronics and the optics. The first application that was RML, the uh, UAV. Um, and, you know, I still wish that we made that a product, but anyway, it, it's coming. Um, so we're able to use that on, on, the, on the small drone. It's like about three, uh, three pounds or so. Uh, I think it can fly for like 20 meters or so. But anyway, it's, the dream is still out there. I know there are a lot of competitors that they're selling uh, uh, like a methane leak detection uh, payload package, and they're like ridiculously priced, right? Like several tens of thousands of dollars. I think it's overpriced. Don't quote me on that. Um, anyway, so I talked about the CS. So this is another application, the, um, was it, the, the Iculase uh, GPA. So I, I want to mention about that because it's, it's a little different platform. Right? You, you guys are familiar with the standoff. This is the analyzer, so meaning that it, it, it wants to detect PP, PPB levels of stuff. And that instrumentation is commercialized to governing applied sciences in Canada. Uh, inside, inside this big giant tube right there, it's designed for ATEX, but inside there's the two mirrors uh, separated by about a mirror or so. The laser being bounced back and, back and, and, back and forth uh, does 25 uh, round trips, and it's about 50 meters of optical pathway. And it gives about 100 ppb sensitivity of, uh, of H2S. Uh, it does uh, water vapor and CO2, and all three gases uh, near simultaneously, because they want to monitor the uh, quality of the natural gas, and you all know that you don't want H2S water, va water vapor in the natural gas streams, and CO2, because that's, that's a junk, right? And you can burn that. Anyway, um, so the scan eagle is a cool one. That's, that's measuring water vapor in the atmosphere. It's as you're using a 2.7 micron laser. It flies around, it's a drone called the scan eagle. We don't own that, it's owned by Boeing. Uh, it actually has flight time around 20, uh, 20 hours or so. But anyway, the reason you want to measure water vapor is because it's the important data that they use it to insert into the, into the, uh, um, what do you call the, the weather model to make it to predict the rains, et cetera. And so that's why we were doing that test uh, to see how well our sensor was uh, working. And so today the, the main, uh, I guess the main entree here is the RML, the OGI. I'll talk about that in the next few slides. Uh, and just to, to give an overview of what's coming up is the, the Falcon XL. I don't know if some of you may have seen that. Uh, this is basically taking the electronics that is in RML, the CS, and putting the giant telescope, and then you can see stuff from you know, 1,000 feet uh, above ground level. It has very good sensitivity. Uh, it flies along the pipelines. And we got, you know, million miles of pipeline, so you're going to need a fixed-wing aircraft to cover that in a short period of time. Uh, on the bottom right there is the E-RAM, the enhanced RAM. Uh, I talked about the RAM before, but this is an uh, enhanced E-RAM, and I'll talk more about that towards the end if we have time. And then, um, and then so changing the lasers and took a few more things. Now, now we also have a uh, ammonia optical gas imager, and then we're working on the uh, CO2 optical gas imager. If you're interested in those two, you can talk to Roy. All right, so let's talk about RML DOGI. So this is what I want to talk about today. Um, if you saw the electronic that was back in 2017, you'd think that I'm crazy. But I, like what I said before, I do like challenging problems. Uh, the, the electronics uh, was filling up the half of the cargo space in the minivan. And we need to connect to the, to the car battery with a transformer, et cetera. 
the transceiver, like the, the box that sent the laser down and received the, 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 the signal, it was one, and a, one cubic foot. And it was heavy, and it was sitting on the tripod, and it was really hard to move. But at any rate, we were able to get a pretty good image in 2017 uh, on the street in, in California. Uh, that was thanks to NYSEARCH and SOCA that helped us do that first, uh, first ever real-world uh, testing of the, of the device. Um, so as uh, shown on the top right, right there, this is giving an idea. You take the, the CS, and the CS laser is, is pretty fixed, right? And so now uh, you need to scan the, the scene. And each, each pixel that we show you on the screen, like there's an example right there from a, a bun on the well. You can see a little of a circular that tells you where we're looking at. And then the pixels, the, pix, the color pixel tells you the concentration of, uh, of that of that location. And so each pixel is actually a, a direct measurement of uh, the concentration of methane PPN meter. Um, there are sort of three, three scanning modes. Uh, one is you know, we can make it act like an RMLD, CS. And so we can do that. You can use it to quickly find leaks. And once you find the leak, uh, you can turn the, the image in mode, or you can leave it out, out there and search for leaks. But when you turn the image, image in mode, then you overlay that PPM mirror concentration into the, uh, the camera image, as, as I've shown over there. Um, and it also it does uh, quantifications. Obviously, for quantification to happen, you're going to need uh, an anemometer or something to tell you about the wind. Uh, and so we all know that um, we all can quantify if we know the wind. We can measure PPM meter. But remember, the, the accuracy of that estimation is going to be highly dependent on the variability of the wind. As we have mentioned before for Discover MLD, we all depend on the wind to give you uh, information for you to be able to estimate the, the, the flux. Um, let's go to the next thing here. Uh, the, the, here is just a, a, what I call a snapshot of what I'm showing you. So basically, this is the early version of RMLD uh, QGI. Sorry about the color, it's confusing, but they didn't have time to paint it green. So that's, that's the gas baggie right there. Uh, pure methane, we open up the valve, let the, the bag settle down, and you see the plume ray coming out of the, uh, the back of the screen. Um, the, there's a prototype right here. Please make sure that you come and play with it. I think we're going to be outside releasing some gas, and so it will be good for you to have a feel this and, and see what, what, what you think about it. I really want feedback from you guys. Uh, let me know, you know how, what, what you think about that. All right? Um, so we did some you know, tests to see you know, how well is it working in the survey mode. Uh, obviously, in the environment, there's two ppm level of methane. We want to make sure that as the distance increases, your measured ppm concentration is uh, increasing linearly with distance, and that's what we see. But the important thing is that the, the system noise characteristic here is very comparable to the RMLD uh, CS. In terms of the quantification mode, uh, we tested leaks anywhere from 0.1 uh, skiff to the about 10 skiff, so that's what um, was it two two gram to, uh, to to 200 grams per hour of of, of leaks. Uh, what we see is that um, leaks that are about uh, one one skiff or higher, uh, as shown here, uh, 19 gram per hour. Uh, our accuracy is about 20 plus or minus 25. Um, so that's that's I think the best you can do. Uh, if somebody tells you it's plus or minus 10, then I I mean, this is indirect method, so I, for the folks from sensoring, it is, it's more of a direct method. This is indirect method, so and in terms of indirect method, 25% is, is very good. Um, bear in mind that uh, there's no, um, let's just say, use of uh, modeling here. This is purely, you know, you know the, your concentration, your measure concentration level, you know the wing information, multiply those two, and you get the, uh, the estimated flow rate. Okay, um, so this is give you a flavor of what we have done so far. Um, this is visualizing the methane plumes. Uh, this is the office complex uh, a gas meter. It's a pretty big one. We actually found there was a leak over there. They thought they fixed it, but I mean, about a year ago we went there, it was pretty big, and a year later it was, they thought they fixed it, but we found another leak, so it, it was still leaking, but not, not as big as before. Uh, just to show you some flavor, you know, in terms of the piping components, these are the plumes that's, that was coming out of it. 
Uh, these were intentionally generated to show you that you can actually see a plume coming out of a piping component. <clears throat> Obviously, you always need a background uh, to have the laser beam scattered back to the device. The bottom of the well gives some really nice pictures. Actually, I like the one on the top and the one on the bottom. The, the one on the top is just you have a little open pipe, and the, the, if you see the video of it, the methane just sort of slowly comes out, and it stops, and it slowly, so it's very intermittent. It's not like it's just constantly coming out at some rate. Same as the, the gas well, they, they kind of like form a vortex ring, as we call it, time over time, okay? Um, storage tank is an interesting one, and thanks to Sean, I think Sean took that, uh, that data. So you can see the, the very, very red spot right there, that's, that's the, 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 the thief hatch, so you can use that as a way of uh, shooting a laser beam to that and it'll reflect back to your transceiver. And we see that the storage tank is actually leaking. Um, uh, just recently, we went to a compressor station. That's very, very different than what I've experienced in the past. Um, usually we look at some, you know, some, some very point sources like a gas mirror. This thing you know, in the compression station is I mean, there's a lot of methane everywhere. It was an interesting environment to test this. Uh, when we were developing the, uh, the RML, the OGI, we were just thinking about you know, the distribution uh, folks. But as we more think about it, I think we can use this from the distribution over to upstream. And that's the, the goal right now. And we want to test these in uh, the upstream, midstream uh, uh, areas to understand more about how these folks, we, we use the instrumentation, how helpful will it be for them to use that, uh, this system for uh, helping them figure out where it's leaking and also quantify how much, well, how much is leaking, okay? You want to be involved? Well, uh, I'm proposing a couple of things here. You can be an early adopter. Uh, you can talk to me or talk to Heath, yeah? Um, you can own, own some pre-production uh, models, prototypes, et cetera. And you can help us, you know, I, I think, you know, um, Roy talks about the quad OB stuff. Um, we definitely need to have some approved procedures for the APA, APA uh, to, to make this as an alternate method. And I, that's relatively easy. We think, we think the RML OGI already qualifies as an OGI. So we just need to write the procedure to, to, to uh, document how we want to do that process. Uh, you can participate as a tester. If you're interested, let me know because we, we're still trying to figure out and find out more use cases for the RMLD uh, OGI. So please uh, talk to me or talk to Paul. Uh, we'll be happy to come to your facility and uh, demonstrate that to your, to your, um, to your surveyors. Okay, upcoming product, I talked about OGI already. We touched about the Falcon XL. This is a, a fixed wing uh, base. Uh, laser um, for, for methane detection, operated by 1,000 feet or so. Um, and then I talked a little about the, the EREM. The important thing about the EREM is that, uh, if you remember, the REM is just a single laser beam. This actually use the, 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 what I call the internals of the RML, the OGI. Now you can scan a vertically, horizontally, or whatever you want, but typically we want to, to, uh, to scan vertically. It gives you a laser flux plane from that. You can now estimate the, uh, uh, the, uh, the emission rate uh, directly. Uh, you don't have to take that information, plug in your computer, use inverse plume model, and figure out how much is leaking. Uh, you can calculate that directly from the data that you obtain from the, from the uh, laser flux plane. All right, uh, I think I'm running out of time. People are standing, so I will, I will, I will leave that there. And, um, Thank you very much. Questions for uh, Shinju? Great presentation, very, uh, Thank you. very informative. The EREM, what do you think your, your laser distance will be? What, what, uh, what's your yep, linear yep. distance? So, um, yeah, uh, so we, no, it, well, that's a, that's a good question. It all depends what, <laughs> what's your reflector. So, so we need a retro reflector. If, if you want to go anything beyond 100 feet, you're going to need like a, a stop sign. But if you have like a facility, like a wall, for example, there's no problem. Or you can paint your facility with some uh, retro reflector tape if it's not a large area, like 50 feet by 100 feet. It's, no, it's, it's pretty, pretty easy. Sorry, was that question, what was the max distance for the OGI? For, for this one? Yeah. Oh, um, 100, 100 feet. Okay. Uh, at 100 feet, what's the spread on that? 
What's the spread on the um, 100 feet? I don't recall the number. It's, it's, it's probably a, a couple of feet of, oh, okay. uh, of a beam area, maybe about a, f a foot or so. Uh, we, we were mainly concentrating on very, very tiny leaks, and so we were able to see 0.1 skiff like three meters away. Good. And we were really happy with that, but I think we can push it. And it's a good question because people are asking now, can I push it even further? Like a, like a hundred skiff was like, well, I can't generate that in my backyard. <laughs> so we, what, what, what we're going to be We can. Those? Oh, well, we'll be happy to come over. <laughs> Hundred skip, a thousand skip, that'd be nice. Easy. Yeah. Um, Easy. I'm serious. Uh, okay. Anyways, um, you see, in there it said your accuracy is plus or minus 25 percent. Is that increased or decreased with the anim with the use of an anemometer? Oh, that's with the anemometer. With the anemometer? Yeah. And then uh, last question was uh, the ERAM capabilities. Is there future potential to implement that into an OGI, a handheld? to be able to actually quantify real time um, utilizing so that way you don't have to do that post-processing like you had mentioned? Oh, yeah, so um, like for example, the OGI, this, we, right now uh, you can see the flux from it, but we don't have an anemometer sort of communicating with the, uh, with the device via BLE at the moment, but the, the flux is calculating uh, in, uh, immediately. Okay, cool. Yeah, you don't have to post-process it. Yeah. Cool. Over here, um, I had a question on, on the uh, 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 QOGI for methane. Uh, you mentioned a compressor station, and uh, I wanted to emphasize that since it's not thermal in OGI, we have a lot of problems with temperatures, having to adjust temperatures and ability to see things that black out because it's a thermal device. Yep. And the background, which can be high, especially in closed, was this an external? Uh, I mean, uh, how? I mean. How, how is that plume looking on that uh, as far as, you know, with high backgrounds, you know, like in a compressor yep, yep. station? Yeah, I mean, for the, for the, for the couple of hours that we were there, we, we were able to, to pinpoint where, where, the, where, where the leak was, was coming out from because where it's coming, out, coming from is very, very high uh, concentration. It's probably percent levels. But we were still able to see even with, uh, with, sort of with a, a large background there, still be able to pinpoint where, where the leaks were coming from. And then one last comment is, as currently defined in the rule, it does meet the definition of an optical gas imaging device. Uh, the specs that talk about delta T because it was always designed right. around a thermal imaging device. Right. There are some things that would have to be danced around. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, we, we don't have to worry about delta T for, for the RML, the OGI, so. Oh. So, um this thing measures PPM meters. And all the regulations that I'm familiar with, at least with Eldar, the leak definitions are PPM. Yep. So if I wanted to, if I used this device and I detected a leak and I wanted to report it as PPM, would I have to measure the distance I'm seeing it from? Yeah, you can do that. Um, we, I think we, we actually wanted to add a sort of a, a uh, what do you call it? a distance measurement device. Yeah, you can do that. Yeah. But even if you know the distance, it's going to be a path average, right? It, uh, along whatever that distance is. So it's the average concentration along that distance that will give you the PPM reading that you, that you see in the instrumentation. Mm. Right? I mean, because the, it could be a pocket of gas or it could be a gas dis distributed over that whole length. Sure. Yeah. sure. You don't know. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Again, one more question. Uh, so you talked about your anemometer. I'm assuming you're doing some sort of just basic 2D Gaussian plume model to get your plus or minus 30, 25 percent. No, 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 no model. No model at all. No model. So all it's the a, it's a mass balance approach. What we'll, we'll I need modeling? Is all the processing done on the unit itself, and the data stored right there? No, yep. nothing you have to send or anything else. Any idea how many? You know, if I was going to a large compressor station or something, I need to do hey, quite a few of them. Stored how many you can do for runs out of memory? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, but you know, you can download the, all the images and stuff, the videos. Uh, if, if if the memory is full, I don't know what the uh, the typical memory space is in the RML and DCS, but it's there's there's actually a slot in there for SD card that you can add more right. to it. Yeah. Thanks. I don't think space is limited at this time. <laughs> Thank you.